school districts to work on that. Uh, one of the areas that uh, we didn't see um, any additional communication on was in the vendor job area. Um, and I know that, that the department did put out some guidance, but somehow there seems to be a communication gap because at least, the, and it wasn't a huge sample, but the you know seven or eight of, of some of the larger school districts that we talked to, they didn't think they got that guidance. And, and so I think it's real important to make sure there's follow-up that everybody's on board and, and, and in fact is receiving the, the guidance on client. Thank you very much, Issa. I'd like to make a comment with regard to oversight of the Department of Education. Absolutely, it's a separate constitutional office, but the state auditor's office in California has a responsibility for conducting the single audit. We audit the Department of Education every single year, looking at all of the federal programs um, and, and make recommendations to the Department of Education. The other thing that I think that can happen in California, and I've been working with the California legislature, because I really appreciate Congress being very actively involved in the Recovery Act. What I did earlier this year, or back in 2009, was met with the Joint Legislative Audit Committee, which is a, a bicameral committee of uh, assembly members and senators, to educate them about the Recovery Act and the importance of the Recovery Act to their districts and to their constituents. So we're working at, with them as an oversight entity to get the legislature more engaged in oversight and enforcing, uh, helping me, because I don't have enforcement authority, to get state entities to implement recommendations. So um, in the past few months, the Joint Legislative Audit Committee has had hearings on some of the reports that I've issued and is planning to have some subsequent hearings over the next couple of months so that the legislature in California is doing what Congress is doing, getting engaged and making sure that, certainly at the state level, that the state agencies are making change and uh, correcting problems that we've identified. But we certainly have a very strong oversight role when it comes to the State Department of Education. And so there is an independent auditor looking at education. And for the Recovery Task Force's point of that, um, we've been working not only to educate the legislature, but we've had a county-by-county county breakdown of the Recovery Act funding that have come, if you will, into the state. We now have it by congressional district, and we're working on assembly district and senate district so that the members understand by category what's actually coming in, how we can work together, which um, you know organizations can we go and target better and say you here these nonprofits could participate in this program or that program. So we're trying to work alongside in doing that. Right. Go ahead. Any other members? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, are you putting that online? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Where are you um, showing how to access that online? Okay. We are we are showing it um, everywhere and anywhere that we can possibly. Try the California. Um, that's, uh, public that's a great idea. That's a because great idea. Because otherwise, you have the information and nobody else other than the electeds or the agencies know about it. Well, we also are doing significant, um, as I said, we've had about 45,000 people now granted. That's a small number in the state, but we've gone out to various communities. I just did for Speaker Bass. Yeah, but to think of the county of LA, 12 million that's people. All. Yeah, I live here. I, well, yeah. that, that's so, I got you. Ms. Um, uh, Chick, uh, one of the that uh, you mentioned was the Work Investment Board, the WIP. And uh, back in my city council days, uh, I found them to be very lacking in, in being able to uh, do the job they were supposed to do because they were hiring the same companies, the companies would let, once they train the people, they would let them go and hire another one to get that subsidy. Uh, I, I would love a copy of the report because that to me is critical to be able to ensure that people who uh, need job training, who uh, can maybe then proceed uh, to uh, moving into jobs that will be available, especially if they're green energy jobs. Uh, so if I might, um, quickly, because I have very brief time, the, the Work Investment Act needs revisiting. And it would be a wonderful time and way at some point soon to for Congress to reassess. Well, let's work on that. Great. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll get something in the right. Okay. Because I agree that. with what, and I am doing more with reports, and I'll be happy to forward them all to you. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Uh, Schultz, uh, the California Recovery Task Force, do you work with small businesses to be able to do job training along with the WIP? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we have a uh, small business advocate and small business... Again, who knows about it? Uh, well, uh, I think that 
we go out to all of the major small business organizations across the state. How about the chambers? We write newsletters, all the chambers. We've worked with every major the city. chamber, the cities. We just met with the uh, California State Association of Counties, with the cities. We go to their meetings. Contract we make contract, contract cities. Okay. Uh, we've been to the malls. Um, Try again the public access channel. <laughs> that, that one we will do. The and that's uh, a great suggestion. Issue, um, there has been in the past a, a much fraud perpetrated on senior citizens on weatherization and many other home improvement areas. Do you also work with the California, um, is it the licensing board that goes out and does a lot of fraud prevention to be able to understand that this is part of where the money is going to is, is weatherization? Yes, absolutely. And with the, not only with those organizations, but with the organizations that represent seniors, children, low income, County Welfare Directors Association, all of them we've been out visiting, doing their meetings, talking about all these various programs, including weatherization. Do you send notices to the cities to put on their reader boards for their uh, uh, public access channels? Um, we will need to do that. We do send out lots of press releases that go out. Press releases lots. don't get on the public access channel. I under, under, understand. Okay. And so that's a great suggestion, and I think we will do that. I appreciate it. Mr. Cal Ms. Calhoun, um, you talked about the Red City funding. That's one of the best things because many of the cities, uh, the counties, or uh, the state gets the money by the time they take their admin fees and then you trickle them down to the locals. You've already lost 20 to 30 percent of the funding and administration, administrative fees. Um, how, how difficult would it be for direct funding to cities um, in, in being able to have all the, the things that go with it, the reporting, the access, the, the you're talking 
talking about. So I had a conversation with a labor official yesterday and said, let's walk through the Davis-Bacon requirements. I just want to make sure that you understand that we're fully supportive of you coming on and being subcontractors. There is a big difference between the prevailing wage in the state and the Davis-Bacon. In most areas, it's lower. But in this economy, I want to understand, as a former labor secretary, I think you probably want uh, jobs in the area. You deserve jobs in the area. And some of the providers that originally were there, they opted out for two or three reasons that I mentioned earlier. One, many of them said, I don't want to do arts. The, the reporting requirements are too difficult. Secondly, some of them did say, I just don't want to do a government program where I'm going to have to get paid less. And the other one that was really significant is that there were some problematic agencies. And on Laura's advice and ours, we did not go out and contract with high-risk agencies. We have been able to work with them. So I'm with you. Well, and I know my time is short, but one more comment and then I'll quit. And that is, Laura, you have a great idea. Why don't all the agencies work together to be able to strategize of what is priority? How do you manage to be able to do all the things we've been discussing here? the general public, to protect the monies of the general public, and to help us do a better job. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the councilwoman wants to be okay. Yes, I'll yield. Okay. You'll okay. you to uh, Congresswoman Richardson. Thank you. Um, got five questions in five minutes, so let's do them in about 30 seconds each. Um, Ms. Howell, I thought I understood in your presentation you said that education had received about a million and had spent half of that. Did I hear you correctly? Uh, the education had, it, there had been $1.6 billion advanced to local school districts, and those school districts, as of September of last year, had spent $570 million. That's why we had a concern with cash management. So, Mr. Payne, when you sat there and said you're doing a great job of oversight, that doesn't sound very great to me, so if you could include that in your report of What's missing? That means you're batting 30%. If any of your students did 30%, they failed. So that's, it's not Thank a Thank you, I appreciate that. Enough. And we will provide that. A little bit of context for the issue. The, um, the, the money was shipped uh, consciously and, and, and overtly to, to stem the tide. It's done so, but it's also money that can be used over a period of time. Uh, and, and, and the context for the districts, of course, is that sort of the, you know, the, the balance is about $45 billion of state and local funds. And as we know, two years ago, that was over $60 billion of state and local funds, and about $7 billion of federal funds. And so they're dealing with, a, 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 on orders of magnitude, a much bigger problem than just the, just for the buckets that can be filled with, with um, Recovery Act money. And so part of, part of our struggle with them is, is, has been to encourage them to spend the money as quickly as possible. At the same time, their natural history has been to, to conserve because the budgets keep uh, keeping back. From that perspective, we know what the rules are. We've been communicating with them that they've got to remit any funds that, that interest is unspent, and we're, and we're engaged with them in that and doing that very actively. Mr. And, Payne, and I, I read, Mr. Payne, yes, I read Ms. Howell's report, and I believe the problems extended beyond that. So in your response to this committee, if you could address the questions that Ms. Howell had, and I would venture to say to you, my recommendation to the school districts with um, for example, Long Beach Unified has sent out 800 notices. I don't know if we have till next year, two years from now. So the question would be, as we're considering closing schools, reducing classes, and all of that, I think some reevaluation has to take place. And you said you're providing oversight. And I'm saying, as a member today of this committee, it doesn't seem to be sufficient. So we'd like to hear further what are you going to do. Number two, um, Ms. Howell, you said that you've provided um, recommendations to the joint legislative body about things that they can implement, if you could provide this committee those, not only with education and any other departments. Mr. Schultz, uh, you mentioned a district by district report, if you could supply that report to this committee. Absolutely. Also, the distressed areas and how that has changed, if you could supply them to this committee. Um, Mr. Schultz and Mr. Payne, um, as I mentioned in my entry level comments when you were here, a lot of the recovery success has got to be that we as members believe and support the state and its departments. I had an instance where it was the first kickoff of the education event. I think California was named first. You guys had an event in my district. I didn't receive an invitation. I didn't receive notification. Um, it, was a, it was really a slap in the face. And so I would say to you, if I have a second chance with the bite of the apple of recovery dollars, they're not going to you. They're going directly to the school district. 
those are the, some of the reasons why, um, some of the reasons that are written in the report, and I think just really an overall lack of respect and inclusion and working with other people who are trying to work with you to be successful. So I just wanted to say that. And finally, Ms. Schick and uh, Mr. Payne. Uh, Ms. Schick offered the MOU. Are you willing to sign it? Uh, not this time. We'll review it. Okay. Haven't you already reviewed it? Well, we have auditors of our own that do spot checks, and we also depend on Ms. Howell's organization to audit us as well. Okay, but okay, I'm talking be... about going out to on the ground to actually look at what's going on at a school district. I would need that MOU. So we would hope that you would reconsider that. I think Ms. Howell is doing a great job, as she obviously noted in her testimony. And I think Ms. Schick and what her office can provide could only help but not hurt. And if you're doing such a good job, you shouldn't be afraid of it. Look forward to your uh, report. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much and, uh, for the comments. Uh, I would just like to make a final comment. Sure. I the last gentleman from uh, the district. Thank you so very much. Uh, in the audience, we have a young man had, that has served on the city council of Inglewood. And I believe that since the former mayor has stepped down, I think Danny Tabor is uh, acting mayor. However, uh, we did not know that he was going to be here three days before, so we cannot call him, Mr. Chairman. But he did ask uh, some questions uh, to the panel, and I would just like to throw them out and if you're not prepared, then you can give them to us in writing. Uh, it's about the city of Inglewood, and it is adjacent to my district. It's the 33rd. Uh, my district is the 33rd, and I think that Inglewood is in the 35th congressional district. So uh, they have been working with uh, addressing transportation and the waste, fraud, and abuse in the use of stimulus funds. So if you have any uh, information on how they are doing with that, we'd like to know. And uh, has Inglewood experienced difficulty in getting funds into uh, shovel-ready projects? Uh, if any of you know about Inglewood, particularly, we'd like to know. And what examples would you have of uh, collaborating uh, with the use of ARA funds. And so these are the questions that would have been asked uh, would, uh, should he have been able to testify. So if you have any information on Inglewood. So Madam, Madam I would say that what we need to do is just submit them in writing. Yeah. Let them okay. respond to them. Those leaders being able to tell us that communities are being revitalized. 
and that businesses are getting back up on their feet. And it's about taking good, hard look at the federal dollars coming out of the bottom end of the funnel in order to make sure we are not losing taxpayers' dollars to waste, fraud, and abuse. It is clear from today's testimony that the Office of Management and Budget and federal agencies still need to work on providing guidance in a clear, consistent, and timely manner so that recipients of the Recovery Act dollars are able to comply with the requirements associated with those funds. It is also clear that some entities here in California, namely the California Department of Education, need to take more seriously the obligation to adhere to the transparency and accountability requirements that must go along with the use of Recovery Act funds. The testimony we heard today also demonstrates that while the Recovery Act has begun to create jobs and has provided much needed assistance to uh, filling California's budget deficit, it also creates another promise, the promise of staggering administrative costs for its implementation and the very real threat of waste, fraud, and abuse. It is estimated that the cost of audit and oversight activities at the Recovery Act funds in the state will be over $6.5 million through fiscal year 2010 to 2011. And with the FBI warning that we can expect 7 to 10 percent of recovery dollars lost to fraud, in my view, every audit and every oversight activity that can be performed to prevent the waste of these funds are priceless. As such, I would like to again publicly call on the United States Senate to take action on the enhanced oversight of state and local economic recovery act, <coughs> which Congressman Ice and I introduced in order to help states and localities defray the expense of implementing the recovery act. Several members of this committee joined with me to pass that bill in the House. Nonetheless, the legislation is still being held up in the Senate. Today we have heard about things going right Things going wrong in the state of California, it is our job as members of Congress and as members of this committee to put what we have learned to constructive use. Whether we represent Brooklyn, New York, or East LA, we need to make sure that our nation's recovery efforts are tailored to work for all Americans, from coast to coast, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Again, I thank our distinguished panel, oh, I mean, of course, coming today, reserving the right to object, the record shall be left open for seven days so that members may submit information for the record. And finally, without objection, I will end